I think the big question is, is it worth it to you to be a CFI? And that answer is different for everybody. It's, do you love to fly? Do you love to teach? And what risks do you anticipate? How, how big are the risks? Are the risks manageable? Welcome to Aviation News Talk, where we talk about what else, general aviation, but also about the great people in our industry. I'm Max Truscott. If you're new to the show, we have a weekly show that shares pilot safety tips and general aviation news from around the world. But we also interview movers and shakers here in our aviation industry for our Newsmakers Editions, and that's what we're doing today. While there's been much discussion in our industry of a CFI shortage, there's a huge supply of potential CFIs, and that's in the ranks of airline pilots. Yet, many of these airline pilots are reluctant to take up flight instruction as a side career because of concerns over their exposure to increased liability that might possibly put their own personal assets at risk. In a moment, I'll be sitting down with John Farrell. He's a lawyer, but also a flight instructor. And we're going to talk candidly about the risk a CFI faces and ways to reduce that potential liability here on this Newsmakers edition. But first, I'd like to thank listener Greg, an airline pilot who's thinking of becoming a CFI, for sending in this question. We answer lots of questions on our regular show, and it's easy to submit a question if you have one that you'd like us to answer. And there are a couple easy ways to do that. If you're listening on your smartphone, just tap on the artwork of your podcast player. When you get to the show notes, click on the link where it says, send us an email. Or better yet, click on the link that says, recording your listener question. Then follow the instructions on how to dictate a question using your smartphone so that listeners can hear your voice. Or just go to our website at aviationnewstalk.com and click on contact. And if you're enjoying this show and are looking for more, you can go to our Patreon website for free where you'll find various links and other interesting stories that I post in the blog portion of that site. And while you're there, if you feel like making a small monthly donation that's billed to your credit card, well, you can do that too. To get to the Patreon site, just go to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. Also, I'd like to give a quick shout out to the many listeners who attended the Accident Wise 2018 Safety Seminar that was held last night. Now, I've loved that for the past four years, and we hold it at Moffett Field in Northern California. We had about 200 people show up last night, and about 50 of you raised your hand saying that you listened to the show. Many of you came up to introduce yourself, and it was fun to meet you for the first time. So I'll talk more about that event in a future show, but for now, let's get started talking with John Farrell. And now to help answer a listener question, I brought in a guest today. John Farrell is a founding partner of Carr and Farrell, a Silicon Valley law firm that specializes in patent litigation and intellectual property matters. He's also a flight instructor, a Cirrus CSIP instructor, and a longtime SR-22 owner. John, we're really excited to have you here on the show today. Welcome. Thanks, Max. I'm delighted to be here. Well, so I brought you in because we had an email from Greg, and here's what he wrote. He said, I'm a 777 first officer with a major U.S. airline. I'm an instructor pilot in the Navy and have my CFII and MEI. And it's becoming commonplace to hear discussions among my fellow airline pilots about being approached by our local flight schools to start instructing again. Now, a common concern has been protecting one's personal assets because, heaven forbid, if an accident were to occur, that could be an issue. He says, are there business structures that can provide protection, such as an LLC or S-Corp? I thought this topic might be good for the podcast, as there are many of us senior airline pilots who would be interested in your thoughts on the topic. Thank you, Greg. So, John, what are your thoughts on this? Well, unfortunately, and this is unfortunate for me as well because I'm a flight instructor, unfortunately, there are no structures, there are no business structures or corporate structures that will completely protect you from liability that might happen as a result of an accident. And so, uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about what I do. I'm, I'm a flight instructor as well, and, and so I've given a lot of thought to this. I have friends who who have assets and who would like to flight instruct or who do flight instruct, you've given thought to this. My planes, uh, I currently have one plane. I've had two for a long time that I use in flight instruction. My planes are owned by an LLC, and I this LLC owns my planes, but the planes are used not only for flight instruction, but they're used for, for some other business activities as well. The reason for, for the LLC structure, aside from some tax benefits and some uh, benefits related to uh, being able to accumulate expenses. One one of the advantages of the LLC for me is that in leasing my plane out or in renting my plane out, if something were to happen to the plane during that rental, the LLC would protect me personally. So, for example, if someone made a hard landing in the plane, they were with another instructor, they made a hard landing in the plane, 
and the brakes failed and they ended up hitting the fence and somebody broke their foot, my LLC would protect me personally from that, from that, from that accident. However, if I'm flight instructing in my plane and we have a hard landing and um, for whatever reason we hit the fence, someone breaks their foot, then a lawsuit will could happen, not necessarily will happen, but could happen. And there will be lots of targets on this lawsuit. One of them would be the manufacturer of the airplane, for example. One would be the manufacturer of the brakes. Uh, there could the, the airport could be sued for having the, the fence in the wrong place. Since I'm the flight instructor, I'm likely to be sued, both as with my LLC, within my LLC, and me personally. And so it's going to be really hard for me to isolate my personal involvement as a flight instructor from a lawsuit brought by someone who's injured or someone's family in the unfortunate event that someone gets killed during the flight and their family as the survivor would have the right to bring the lawsuit. So I guess the short answer is an LLC or a corporate structure is not going to protect you personally. And the longer answer is that Almost everybody involved in any accident is going to be a potential target in a lawsuit. But it's not just flight instructing, and this is one of the things that gives me a little comfort, or maybe maybe it should make it, it should worry us more. But life is inherently risky. It's um, there's just it's just unsafe uh, being alive in in some sense, and we can do um, the, the the best we can do really is to try to safely arrive at death. And so um, we go through life, and I think of all the ways that we can get hurt. If you, Just slipping and falling, for example, is the second leading cause of death in the world. Accidental cause of death is just slips and falls. And if you're, if you're a senior citizen, it's the number one accidental cause of death is slipping. And the closest I ever came to dying in an airplane was falling off of a of a step on a 182 that was was frozen, and I was checking the fuel on a 182, and I fell off and came within inches of hitting my head on the propeller as I fell to the ground. And so there, there's there is just a lot of inherent risk in everything that we do, and including driving. So it's I think it's important if there's something you really love doing to to sort of keep it in perspective, and that's one of the things that that keeps me flight instructing. I know that. Flying, there is some risk to it. It's not as safe as driving, for example. But I do drive. I drive my friends. I drive other people. I drive people at work. I drive my clients who come and visit me. I drive them to, to restaurants uh, or we drive together. And so there is risk in me driving. I would get sued in the event that I had, was to get to run a red light, for example, and get hit by a car. I would be liable for that accident. In the same way, if I'm flight instructing and we have an accident, I'll have some liability there, but there's there's ways to minimize that risk, and and that's what I try to do, and we try to do that in all of in all of life as we we manage risk, and as a flight instructor, I think that's really important. There's a lot of things that we can do to manage risk. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. You've obviously chosen to give flight instruction, even though you know that there are risks. First of all, tell us why do you do it? Well, I probably do it, Max, the same reason you do it, and the same reason all flight or most flight instructors do, at least flight instructors who are doing it part-time or as a second career. We love to fly, and we love to teach. And the great thing about, about doing something you really enjoy and really love doing is you want to share it, and you want, you want other people to appreciate it as much as you do. And I, I, I love flying, and I enjoy, I enjoy um, sharing flights with other people, not just flying myself, but actually sharing the joys of flying. It's just amazing. You know, Max, you and I have flown all over the country together, and, it, and, and we both have a large number, a high number of hours. You have um, way more hours than I do, I'm sure, but um, I'm approaching 4,000 hours of flying, and every time I take off and every time I land, it's still, it's still an amazing experience. And those are the kinds of experiences you just want to share, and you want to teach others to be able to enjoy those and appreciate those. So that's why I do it. And I know there's risk, but I'm, it's, it's a risk that I'm willing to, it, it, as long, so long as I can manage the risk, it's a risk I'm willing to accept. 
Yes, I, I agree with everything you said there about uh, flight instruction. It is just fantastic. It's fun to help people achieve their goals and you know to have the shared progress and just the fun of being up there together. Now, in terms of mitigating risk, are there other things that flight instructor might do in terms of, and I'm just thinking, either using standardized syllabi or documenting uh, every flight so that if a case comes up, they've got great contemporary records? What, what do you recommend? Well, so th- there are ways we can mitigate risk, not just for flying, but really in everything that we do. If you're a doctor, if if you are driving a car, if you're you know, going to an event, there's, there's just certain things that we should do to manage risk. So as a flight instructor, I think it begins with your student choosing students that feel like they're low risk to you. And I don't mean just students that, that aren't crazy or clients that aren't crazy. And we've, we've all had some of those where we've, we've flown with clients who are just, who are just unpredictable and a little crazy. And I think, Max, one of the things that you, you said to me one time, the most dangerous flight crew in the world is two CFIs in, this, in the same cockpit because they're kind of both in charge and feeling in charge and both a little unpredictable at times. But we want to be with clients who are predictable and clients we feel good about being with. And sometimes you just get a really bad feeling about someone you're flying with. And that's probably that's probably not a good relationship. And that's probably a more a more risky relationship than someone who's not. Also, I try to avoid sketchy airplanes. You and I have had this conversation before. Uh, I love airplanes with air conditioning, especially in the summer. I try to teach in, only in airplanes with air conditioning. And the good thing about that is those airplanes tend to be a little bit newer and they tend to be a little bit better maintained. And so I have flown in some real beaters. We all we all have in, in planes that I thought as we were rolling down the runway for the first time, this plane is never going to get off the ground. And so we want to, we want to avoid airplanes that, that seem or, or could have maintenance problems. And those are, we just have, sometimes we just have a gut feeling about it. We look at the plane, we walk around, we're kicking the tires and everything seems to work, but you're just wondering how it could possibly work. Also, we want to teach within our skill set, And I think this is really important. Flight instruction is is relatively safe on the sec- in the spectrum of GA flying. Flight instruction is some of the safest flying that you can do. But the reason it's so safe, or some of the reasons it's so safe, is that we do it in a very controlled way. You mentioned a syllabus, Max. I think that's really important, having a standardized syllabus for that airplane and for the level of student. Also, we fly at a local airport or within 50 miles or so of an airport, and so it's easy to get on the ground if there's a problem, if there's a weather problem. But beyond that, it's just teaching within your skill set. And I think some of the more dangerous teaching that we do is when we go cross country. For example, some flights you and I have made together and Max, you and I, I think we flew cross country one time. I don't remember whether it was Atlanta from California, but we, we did a, we've done some cross country flying and we've all, as a flight instructors, we often get asked, Hey, can you help me deliver an airplane to, you know, to, to Maine or to New Hampshire or to, to Southern Florida from California, or Oregon or Washington? Those long distance flights can be relatively more stressful, more dangerous, uh, if depending on the level of your student and the weather and the, the timing in which you have to make the flight. And so I think it's important to understand your own skill set as a flight instructor. Are you competent or capable of flying over the mountains in this small airplane at night? Or are you feeling good enough about the weather or your skills in flying for example, example, hand flying through IMC, long distances if necessary for a particular trip. So just being within that skill set and also within the skill set of the airplane. You know, you're, one of the things I've, I've mentioned to you, Max, is that I would love to someday teach in seaplanes. And although I'm licensed in both single engine and multi-engine seaplanes, it would be folly for me right now to go grab a, you know, a King Air on floats get five hours, well, I, have, I have five hours in a King Air or a Queen Air and fly, you know, a Queen Air on floats and, and give lessons in it. It would just be be crazy. It would be way outside my skill set. And yet we often see flight instructors with the opportunity to grab a, grab a student in a plane, plane they're unfamiliar with and go teach. And so we, we have to be careful. That's a, that's a great way to, to reduce risk is to stay within the, the skill set that you have or develop the skill set, expand the skill set to include clients that you want to bring in. 
And I think you and I have both chosen to specialize, uh, <laughs> coincidentally, both on the Cirrus. Uh, prior to specializing in the Cirrus, I specialized in the glass cockpit aircraft. And I did, for example, teach tailwheel for a while, but then I thought, you know, I'm just not an expert in that. And I started just referring tailwheel clients to other people who do specialize and are experts in that. I've often thought that flight instructors, uh, perhaps in you know rural areas where they've got a limited number of clients to serve, I have to become a jack of all trades, and that can be a challenge. You know, if you're going to fly any airplane that happens to come around, <laughs> that sounds like higher risk. And we've all been to these really small airports, you know, and I, I'm thinking of some of those in eastern Southern California where they're dusty and the planes are dusty and there's half of or multiple parts of multiple planes. And, you know, that's, those are the planes that, that people own and that people fly. And if you're, if you're the only flight instructor at an airport like that, or one of one or two flight instructors, you're absolutely right. You have to fly what's there. But I think it's important to learn to learn to fly what's there, or to become competent at what's there. If you're going to if you're going to fly in those planes, I found, for example, I've been teaching strictly in Cirrus now, probably for five or six years, and I try to teach at a pretty high level. I I, I work really hard to to stay proficient, to get training. I train every year uh, with Cirrus. To, to get better and to, to stay current. But even within the Cirrus, the Cirrus family, there is a pl- proliferation of avionics and it's become increasingly complicated just within Cirrus to stay at a very high level. So I can't imagine what it would be like having to teach in biplanes and, you know, tricycle gear and tailwheel and a variety of planes that just or, you know, or scattered across a, a small rural airport. I agree with you. That would be very difficult. Or even multi-engine as well. I mean, that's totally different. And though I have an MEI, I just consciously decided not to teach in uh, twins. I know folks who do specialize in them. Now, in terms of Greg's talking about working for a local flight school, you were talking about choosing clients, but I would imagine he wants to be careful about choosing a flight school. Well, I think that's right. I think there's all flavors of flight school. And one of the things that you had mentioned was was using a syllabus, and I think professionalism of the flight school can make a huge difference in the safety of the operations of that, and it, not just the safety of the operations, but the safety of the airplanes, and it just goes, it cuts all the way across. Working with a flight school has some advantages because typically the flight schools are carry insurance, they do, the, the maintenance is, is often done and overseen at the flight school. There are often waivers that, that students at flight schools sign as part of the process. And the, in the event that there's an accident, typically it's the flight school that will be the primary target of a litigation to that unfortunately happen. But there's some downsides to flight school as well. You don't get to choose the clients as easily at times. And also the airplanes, there may be pressures on, on flying not only certain airplanes, but also under certain conditions just to keep the operations going. So there's there's good and bad, but I think you know, it's really important in flying. We, we carry this sixth sense with us. Sometimes we just, it doesn't feel right, and, and we just have to listen to that. I've, I, and I, as crazy as this is, I've taxied up to the runway in, in my life multiple times, and I've looked out, and I've looked down the runway, and I've looked at the panel, and I've I've just turned the plane around and I've taxied back to the hangar. And for reasons I couldn't even explain, it just didn't feel right to fly at that moment. Yeah, I totally agree. I actually remember being in an airplane with you on a very cold day in uh, Illinois in the wintertime. And we had just put the airplane in a heated hangar and it was, we were taxiing back. I, I thought I saw some, what was water uh, still on the wing. And then I thought, wait a minute, I wonder if that refroze and if that's ice on the wing. So it was just kind of that nagging thought that led us to stop the plane, get out and find, oops, yes, the water had refrozen on the, uh, the airplane. So I agree, you have to honor all those you know, six senses that you tend to have. Now, as an independent CFI, do you do any kind of a waiver for the folks that you're working with? I don't, although I think it would be a reasonably good practice to do that. And I think waivers can be effective. So let's talk about the waiver and then we'll talk about the process. So a waiver is a contract. And it's a contract that says, you agree to do certain things and I agree to do certain things. And it also is possible in a waiver to assign some risk. That is to say, I recognize that, that taking flight lessons 
in general, taking flight lessons in this airplane, taking flight lessons with you carries some risk with it. And I understand that in the event that there's an accident that I'm not going to sue you unless the accident was caused by, by your negligence or by some unreasonable risk that you took. And so in most states, it's not possible to completely waive liability, especially for acts that are obviously intentional or acts that involve unreasonable, unreasonable actions or unreasonable risk or recklessness. So if you do use a waiver, I think it's important within your state to, to find an appropriate waiver. And then the question is, well, when do you have someone sign the waiver? And I think the re- a really great time to do that is at the first lesson when you sit down and do all the, the TSA paperwork. We have to, and I'm not just sure exactly what you do, but I pull out my iPhone. I take a picture of their passport. I take a picture of their driver's license. I take a picture of their airplane registration if they have one, their medical, their license, so that if I get audited by the TSA, I'll have that, that whole file available to me. I think that's a great time also to say, you know, here's my waiver. Um, I'm going to fly with you and, and provide you ongoing instruction. I'd like you to sign my waiver. And as long as the waiver is reasonable and not, not 10 or 15 pages long, but just you know a short waiver that assigns risk appropriately, I think most people are willing to do that. I know if you go down to the corner to the go-kart raceway down the street here in Silicon Valley, they have you sign a waiver if you go and play softball um, with a league, you sign a waiver. Almost everything we do in life nowadays, there's waivers. So I don't think signing the waiver is particularly burdensome or onerous, but it may be helpful in some cases. Let's talk about CFI insurance. What role does that play and how could that help someone like Greg if he decides to teach on the side? Well, so insurance is what makes the risk manageable to a large degree. I mean, there's things you can do. You can choose your students. You can choose the plane. You can choose the flight school. You can have the waivers. You can fly carefully. And we all do those things. But at the end of the day, stuff happens. And that's the purpose of insurance. And so I carry three kinds of insurance in my, my, my role as CFI. I have insurance on my airplane, which everybody does. Banks require it, but beyond that, it's just a smart thing to do to cover the value of the airplane plus damage that could occur as a result of use of your airplane. And my, my personal coverage tends to be $1 to $2 million in, in liability. And so it's not so expensive. I think uh, my insurance policy probably ranges in for that liability insurance, some somewhere in the four thousand to six thousand dollar range. I have a I have a Cirrus that's relatively new, so it's a it has a high haul value. So that's one type of insurance. I carry a second type of insurance that I use for teaching, and I get this through Falcon. It's through NAFI, National Association of Flight Instructors. I think it's got a one million or maybe a million. I think it's a one million dollar policy. Uh, I'm not quite ex- quite sure how much I spend on that, but it's probably something in the order of eight hundred to a thousand dollars a year, and so that gives me a million dollars of insurance if I'm flight instructing in someone else's plane. So it's it's not in my plane, but if it's if it happens if I happen to be teaching in someone else's plane, then um, then that insurance policy covers me, and I think that that. And I'm, I'm not certain about this, but I think that that policy covers me for any coverage that's not for which I'm not covered in that other person's airplane. So that policy is a little cheaper because because it tends to be a policy that that covers the event that their policy doesn't. I carry a third type of insurance, and this is just by virtue of the fact that you know as a I have another career and I have other assets. But I carry an umbrella policy for those two um, activities and, and driving as well. And the umbrella policy is really pretty broad. It covers almost everything that is not excluded. And there's some things that are not excluded. But it turns out that flight instructing is not one of the things that's specifically included as an, as an exclusion in my umbrella policy. And I think the umbrella policy covers, uh, covers a window from about up to about $5 million. But I think it has a $2 million deductible. And the $2 million deductible is presumably covered by my primary policies. And it's intended to stack on top of my flight, my airplane policy, and my auto policies, which are also $1 or $2 million. And so 
that's the package that I have for flying is I have a policy on my airplane for liability. I have a flight instructor's policy that I got through through NAFI. And I also have a, a separate policy, which is an umbrella policy, which stacks on those, on those two. So, John, how commonly do you think flight instructors do get sued? And if they were to get sued, what would you suggest you know, they do if that were to actually happen? Okay, so I'm not an aviation lawyer, but I have handled in my practice a lot of aviation issues. I've bought and sold airplanes for companies, and I've had students who've gotten in trouble with the FAA. And I also get contacted from time to time by flight instructors, friends or referrals of friends who who have had issues, and they call and say, hey, John, you know, I've, got, I've had this, this incident. What do I do about it? Fortunately, I don't know a single incident. Well, I, I do know a couple of flight instructors who have been sued. It's generally a friendly suit brought not against the flight instructor, although the flight instructor is named, but it's a suit that's really brought against the flight instructor's insurance policy. And that does happen, and I'm, I'm not going to tell you that it doesn't happen if you're a physician you know, if you have physician friends, most physicians are frequently sued for malpractice. And it's not that they personally are sued, but it's just, these are essentially lawsuits against the insurance company. So I think that does happen some. Fortunately, we don't have very many accidents that occur with flight instructors. They're not, I wouldn't say they're rare, but in the spectrum of overall accidents, flight instruct, instructional accidents are relatively uncommon and especially where there's serious accidents. But one of the great things about our, our insurance system is generally if you get sued and you have an insurance policy, the suits nearly always settle within the limits of the policy. And so it's very seldom that a litigant will sue you if you have insurance and then come after you personally for an amount above the insurance. And there's, there's a number of reasons for that. But just, first of all, just knowing that I think is, is comforting. It's comforting to me. But understanding why that is, I think, is useful too. If you were to sue my insurance company, I as a defendant would be relatively cooperative, at least cooperative. At least I wouldn't be uncooperative. I pay for the insurance. It's there. I really want to see you made whole to the extent that you can. And so as a defendant, I'm not going to be so resistive. The lawyer who's representing you, he's probably doing this on a contingency. That, In other words, he only gets paid if he recovers something. So he's going to want a high probability of recovery. And with an insurance company, it's their job to pay in the event that there are damages. There is likely going to be a high probability of recovery for the, for the plaintiff's attorney. However, if he comes out for me personally, it's a completely different fight. If he's trying to take my personal money, I'm going to fight tooth and nail to prevent that. And depending on my assets, there may not even be much for him to get at. But for a contingency lawyer who only gets paid if he wins, it's a much different calculus as to whether he's going to take on the case. And, and it's going to be expensive. A, a lawsuit can cost, you know, even a simple lawsuit is a half a million dollars in California. It could easily go to a million dollars. Plaintiff's attorneys who deal in these kinds of slip and fall and accident cases, they're not going to want to engage in a contingency lawsuit where the maximum damage they can get is only a couple of million dollars. For example, my law firm, I, I litigate, and, and occasionally we will take on, and we don't, we only do business litigation. Occasionally we'll take on a, we'll take on a contingency case, but it's very, very rare. But to, to make the contingency case worthwhile, there has to be damages, and these are corporate damages, typically in the 50 to $100 million range. And we just don't see this in, in aviation accidents involving general aviation. The, the numbers are just not that high. So it's difficult to find a lawyer who's going to take a case on contingency and have to really fight for the money. It's easy against the insurance companies because the insurance companies eventually will settle. They want to keep everybody happy, including the policyholders. But to go after you personally, it's a, it's a different calculus. And the other thing that's important to note is that in most, in many states, I, I can't speak to most states because I don't know most states, but 
in many states there's something called a homestead law, which means that some or, or all of the, the equity that you have in your home is protected from, from judgment creditors. So in California, it's not very much. It's $75,000 or $100,000 in value. It's, the numbers just haven't really kept up. In places like Texas, it's different. Nevada has a homestead law. Many states have these homestead laws where the value of your home is protected from judgment creditors. So depending on the state, that, that should give you some comfort as well. Well, John, to kind of sum it all up, what kind of advice would you give Greg overall about this? Well, I, I think the big question is, is it worth it to you to be a CFI? And that answer is different for everybody. It's, do you love to fly? Do you love to teach? And what risks do you anticipate? How, how big are the risks? and Are the risks manageable? And I think for me, the things I love doing in life are a little more risky than not. And I'm not willing to just sit in my, my lazy chair all day staring at the TV screen trying to avoid risk. The things that bring enjoyment to life, for me, do involve a little more risk. And so I'm willing to take the risk, but I'm, I'm, it's important to me to manage the risk. And I think that's the key thing, is if you're going to do something, whether it's flying or race car driving or downhill slalom skiing, is take the steps to manage the risk. And... And then do what you want to do. I think that's to, that's the advice. That if, if I'm giving lawyerly advice, that's it. Do what you want to do, but just take the, the reasonable steps to manage that risk. John, thanks so much for shedding light on all of this. Now, I'm kind of curious for folks that want to follow up with you in any way, whether it's as a flight instructor or even as a, an intellectual property type of issue, where do people find out more about John Farrell? They can Google me, and I'm in Menlo Park, California. Just Google my name, Menlo Park, California, is my office, and I'll show up there, and I'll probably show up as a flight instructor as well. So I think that's probably the easiest way, just do an internet search. That's great. Thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Take care, Max. Fly safely. Well, thank you, John. John's one of my favorite people, and he's a busy guy who runs a large law firm that specializes in patent litigation and intellectual property issues here for high-tech startup companies. And he somehow still finds time to do a lot of flight instruction in his Cirrus SR-22. And I want to really thank him for taking the time out of his busy day to share his thoughts with you here today. Well, please stick around for bloopers at the end, and let me remind you that if you're looking for flight instruction on a Cirrus SR-20 or SR-22, or are thinking maybe about buying a new or slightly used Cirrus, please contact me early in the process so I can help you with that decision. I specialize in the Cirrus and work with people literally around the world. If you love the show, by the way, please show your friends how to find this podcast. And until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up. So how come do you, man, I should get more sleep at night. <laughs> <laughs> You're flying too much. Exactly. Oh, can you hold, can you hold just for a second? Of course, go ahead. Uh, my, the lights went off in the room because I've been holding still. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, the, I'm, I'm sitting in the dark. I'm really okay, disappointed we're not doing this as video. <laughs> yeah. No, the lights just went off. And I'm, all right. All right. I'm, yeah. I'm back. All right. Super. All right.